Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're gonna to be talking about iodine testing. In fact, we're gonna go over the six ways that you can check iodine inside of your body. And I'm also gonna talk about why I actually don't recommend that you do that. And I think it will become evident as we talk about the various aspects and all the, uh, the inconsistencies that are associated with iodine testing and so on. Now iodine testing, actually iodine in general is a very controversial topic. So of course this one will probably be controversial as well, even though I have no desire for it to be. I just wanna provide you guys with information and give you my viewpoint as always. So before we do that though, I wanna talk about some general facts related to iodine. These are really important because they will create the framework upon which we build and talk about the testing and why I make the recommendations that I do. So number one, all humans need iodine. Iodine is required by all humans because it is required by the body to produce thyroid hormone. If you do not have enough iodine, you will not be able to produce thyroid hormone. And eventually, if you run out of thyroid hormone, that status is incompatible with life. Therefore, iodine is required for the production of thyroid hormone, which is required for the production of life. Humans cannot create it. They must get it from their diet or they must get it from supplements. That's it. You need it. That's just, that's just the fact. That's physiology 101. Number two, iodine is stored predominantly inside of the thyroid gland. This is important because it impacts how easily we can check iodine levels in the body. It's predominantly stored in the thyroid gland, and we don't really have a good way of getting inside of the thyroid gland short of sticking a needle in, pulling out some, some of your thyroid cells, opening them up and looking in there. Now that's not practical, or an, I don't even know if that, that's possible, by the way, to check the individual iodine status of a, of a single thyroid glandular, of a thyroid gland cell. It's just not practical. So what we have to do is we have to use other ways to sort of assess iodine, and we'll be talking about those as we go. Number three, other tissues, even though the majority of the thyroid gland is stored in, or even though the majority of iodine is stored in the thyroid gland, other tissues still need iodine. This is important if you do not have a thyroid or if your thyroid has been ablated because you still need iodine. They don't need as much as the thyroid, but they still need some. So you still need to be at least somewhat worried about iodine, even if you don't have a thyroid. Number four, iodine has the potential to be harmful if taken in excessive doses. Now this is kind of where the controversy comes in because you have people who will say everyone should avoid iodine, you have people who say everyone should use iodine, and yet on the other hand, you have people who say everyone should not only use iodine, they should use massive doses of iodine. Um, now it is the case that sometimes these, these various things can be true and we'll talk about that in a second, but for you should also be aware that in high doses of iodine can absolutely be harmful. Not to everybody, but it can, can definitely hurt some people. So be aware of that. Number five, standard testing is typically not very accurate for all the reasons we're gonna be talking about uh, before. And number six, individual iodine intake varies very dramatically, so it's hard to make general advice. This is why you have a lot of different camps out there. You have the people who are like, we're the no iodine camp, everyone should, should not consume iodine. We have the, the uh, everyone should take iodine camp, and then we have the everyone should take you know massive doses of iodine camp. Now, people kind of fit into these different categories because everyone is a little bit different. Everyone lives in a different area. Everyone has different dietary preferences. Everyone is taking different types of supplements. People have different types of thyroid problems, right? So they can fit into these camps and everyone is fighting over whatever camp that they're in saying that we're right, even though the truth is everybody's, also, everybody's probably a little bit right in each camp. The, the, the hard part is figuring out where you lie. And so a lot of people think, okay, well, maybe we can use iodine testing to figure that out. I don't think it's quite that easy and we'll be talking about that now. So let's jump into the various ways that you can check iodine. So number one, we have urinary iodine levels. And what this means is you can just check your iodine, or check the iodine status inside of the urine. Now, why is this helpful? Well, we know that the majority of iodine, well, one of the ways that your body gets rid of iodine is through the urine. So if there is iodine inside of the urine, you can sort of infer or make the assumption that the body already had enough. Otherwise, it wouldn't be peeing it out, right? That's sort of the idea here. Now, there's different ways that you can check. Uh, and by the way, the opposite is true. If you have no iodine in your pee, well, then your body probably needed it, right? So your iodine has, it, it can be good, but it's predominantly good in testing or assessing the iodine intake of a large population. So if you wanted to say, let's look at the entire state of, uh, I don't know, uh, California. Let's see how much iodine the average person consumes in, in California. So we will check everybody's uh, urinary levels and we'll see how much they're peeing out or if they're not peeing any out. And we can kind of say, okay, everyone in California is either getting enough or not enough, or they have you know, just the right amount. That's really what this is good for. It's not good for assessing the individual intake of an individual or the, the intake of an individual because the, you ha, your diet may change day to day. So you have to check multiple times, in fact, hundreds of times to get a good idea of how much somebody is consuming on a yearly basis to get an accurate representation of their day to day intake. So that's just not practical, right? So it's not something that we're gonna be doing um, and it's just not something that you would ever want to do because who's gonna to wanna to do that three or 400 times, right? This is not something you're gonna do. 
Now within the urinary iodine level, there are different ways you can do it. You can do the spot urinary level, which is to just take your pee at any random time of the day and look at it and figure out how much iodine is being peed out. You can do the iodine to creatinine ratio, which is slightly more accurate. And this test, what it does is it says, okay, how much is iodine, how much iodine is in your urine compared to how well your kidneys are functioning? That's what the creatinine is a, is a marker of. So that one is slightly more accurate because you're comparing it to your kidney function, right? That's important because a lot of people have kidney problems or kidney disease, or they get rid of iodine at, at different rates, right? So this is more accurate. And then number four, you can do a 24 hour urinary iodine test which means that you basically pee inside of a gallon for 24 hours and check the whole day's worth. Now this is, again, not very practical, it's not very convenient, patients don't like doing it, and it's fraught with a lot of problems because how do you know you got every last drop and how do you know you, you went in there every time you needed to, what if you forgot once or twice? So the 24 hour, uh, even though it's probably slightly more accurate, it has other issues which make it not desirable. So between all of these, and probably the best one that you'll wanna choose if, if you're really interested in checking your iodine, is the iodine creatinine ratio. That's probably the most accurate of these ones that we're gonna be talking about. Number two, not only can you check iodine in your urine, you can also check it in your serum or in your blood, right? So this is good if you want to see, if you, this is actually really good because uh, it can assess how much is being excreted out of the body, but only in cases where you've taken high doses. So if, the, if your serum level is normal or low, that is not very accurate. But if it's high, then it means that you probably had too much. And the reason is that your body will attempt to eliminate iodine, excess iodine through the blood to get it into the kidneys where it can then pee it out. So the serum and the urine are somewhat similar in that way, uh, but they're still not very accurate. So this is good for somebody, serum iodine, if you wanna check it, is good for somebody who uh, thinks they have taken, or maybe accidentally or intentionally, massively high doses of iodine, because it will show up in the serum if that's the case. But if you check your serum iodine and it's normal or, or low, that doesn't mean that it's actually normal, or, normal or, or low. So it's inaccurate in that way. But it is good if you, if you wanna know if you actually had high levels, if for whatever reason that's um, what you're checking for. Now, one of the benefits to serum iodine is the fact that it's so easily available. And if you already are grabbing your blood for some other reason, you could throw that on and check it, which is why I think a lot of doctors tend, tend to order the serum iodine, even though the urinary iodine levels tend to be a little more accurate and um, also a little more convenient for the patient. Number three, we have something called serum thyroglobulin. Now, thyroglobulin is not the same thing as antithyroglobulin, so don't be confused, okay? Thyroglobulin is the protein that is synthesized or created inside of the thyroid gland. And it is a protein that's involved in the production of thyroid hormone. Antithyroglobulin antibody is the thing that you get when you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That is the thing where your immune system is attacking your thyroid gland. These are two separate things, even though they, have, they share um, a similar name. Now, what we know is that um, thyroglobulin it, when it gets high, that's usually a sign of deficiency in certain areas. And it's usually used as a, a measure to check population studies or the, the iodine status of populations. Now, the problem is for our context is that even though it can potentially be used in that situation, it cannot be used and is inaccurate if you have elevated antithyroglobulin antibodies, which is the majority of us talking, listening, the majority of you listening to this right now, because that's associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So I know that most of the people I talk to have Hashimoto's, they have hypothyroidism, they have their thyroid removed. And a lot of these people have elevated antithyroglobulin antibodies. Therefore, this test is really not accurate to them. So even though it can be used in certain situations, it's not good if you have any sort of thyroid problem, really. Number four, we have the iodine patch test. Now this is one that a lot of people will use. I see this also in a lot of alternative health sort of circles, integrative medicine type stuff. Um, unfortunately, it's not very accurate. The idea behind this is that you will paint a, uh, a square of iodine onto your body, you will let it absorb over 24 hours and you will see how quickly it absorbs. And then the idea is if it absorbed really quickly, then your body must have needed it, therefore you are iodine deficient. Now the problem is there's a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, evaporation can impact it, the, the skin can impact it, how, how quickly it's absorbed. Um, it just, it, a lot of inaccuracies there. So it's hard to make any, any sort of definitive judgment based off of the, the numbers, as well as it hasn't been validated. So the results are like kind of up in the air in terms of what they actually mean for your body. It might be beneficial on certain people and I understand what the draw and the appeal of doing it because it, you don't have to go to a doctor, you don't have to get your blood test, you don't have to pee in a cup, you just do it on your skin, you can do it rel relatively easily. The problem is it's just not very accurate. So I wouldn't base a lot of your decisions about what's going on in your body and your, your iodine status on this particular test, uh, but I do see the appeal of why certain patients like to do it. Number five, we have what's called the iodine loading test. Now among integrative and, and functional medicine circles, this one is probably considered to be the most accurate um, but I don't recommend doing this one because it also has, it, it contains with it the potential for problems and I'll explain why. So in this test, really what you do is you load yourself with a massive dose of iodine and then you check your urine for 24 hours to see how much you are peeing out. And the idea is you take this massive dose of iodine, 
right? And if your body needed it, it would use it and you wouldn't pee any out. So when you check your 24 hour urine, you would see less iodine in the urine, which would indicate your body needed more iodine. And if you peed it all out and then some, you would say, okay, the body definitely didn't need any more iodine because it just, we gave it this huge dose and it just peed it all out, right? So that's the idea behind it. The problem is, the biggest problem I would say, if you are somebody who's concerned about iodine, then why on earth would you want to take a massive dose of about 50 milligrams of iodine to check for it, right? So it, it doesn't make any sense. It's not compatible with one another. If you're concerned about iodine, then you wouldn't want to take huge doses of iodine because you're, that could cause more problems. And indeed, I've seen it cause problems in individuals. So because of that, if you want to do the urinary method, even though it may be slightly more accurate than other methods here, it still is much safer to do the, the urinary to creatinine ratio uh, because you can avoid that iodine loading issue and you avoid the, the complication for potential issues down the road because you're taking that massive dose. Also, to my knowledge, I don't think this one has been validated either. And then number six, we have the basically the hair iodine level. So what you can do is you can pull some hair out, you can look at the iodine content of that hair, and the idea is, well, let's assess the level of the iodine content in the hair, let's correlate that, and we can make an inference on what's happening inside of the body. Does the thyroid gland have enough or, or not enough or so on? The problem is this one has not been validated as well, so it's hard, and there's not a, there has, what I mean by validated is, is nobody has said for sure that the levels of iodine found in the hair correlate directly with the levels of iodine found inside of the thyroid gland or inside of the body. So I wouldn't recommend using this one either, uh, but it can be used if you're going to use it in conjunction with other tests here. So let's say you got your hair analysis, let's say you got your, your urinary to creatinine ratio, uh, uh, your iodine to creatinine ratio, and maybe some other tests, right? Your serum iodine level. So if you put all these together, well, then it starts to paint a picture for you. So it may be useful in that setting, but I would not hang your hat on just the hair analysis as a measure of what's actually happening with your iodine inside of your body. So those are the tests that are available. Now I'm gonna recommend what you should do as a patient if you're listening to this. What are your next steps? So the first thing I would ask that I would have you ask yourself is, do you have a problem? Is there any reason for you to want to test your iodine level? Um, and is that a good reason? Because what I have found is the majority of people who want to check their iodine, they do so out of curiosity because they think it's going to have some impact on how they're, they're either they're curious or because they think it will impact their treatment in some way. Now, I would caution against that approach because most thyroid patients can do a hundred other things before they even think about checking their iodine status. They can focus on their thyroid function. They can focus on their thyroid medication. They can focus on their thyroid lab test. They can focus on their immune system, their gut health, and so on. All of these things are, are more reliable and easier to test for and will have a greater impact on, on what you're gonna be doing with your body and your treatment as opposed to checking your iodine. So ask yourself, do you have a problem? What is the reason for which you're trying, or what are you thinking you're going to gain by checking your iodine level? And if you don't have a good reason, then definitely don't just do it willy-nilly because it might just throw confusion into what you're trying to do. Number two, before you check your iodine, I would recommend that you take stock of iodine intake from all sources. Now, what you probably don't realize is that iodine is found in a lot of different areas, some of which you probably didn't hear about. So here are some of the most common places. Number one, high iodine intake from foods. That would include sea vegetables and seafood and so on. So these ones are kind of obvious, but at least pay attention. Do you think, are you eating more or less of these type of foods? Number two, beauty products. This one is not very well known, but beauty products do contain iodine and that iodine can be absorbed through the skin and get into your body. And if you're using beauty products that have a high iodine content, then that could potentially be a source of iodine that you did not know you were consuming or that even though you're not consuming it by mouth, it's still getting into your body. Number three, medications. Some prescription medications have iodine built into them. Check your medications, look at the inactive ingredients, see if iodine is in any of those inactive binders or fillers. Number three, or number four, supplements. So of course, supplements are a little bit easier to check for because if you look on the back of the nutrients, it will say iodine. You can look right at it and take stock of how much iodine you're getting from your supplements. And then lastly, think about salt. So iodized, so salt can be iodized, which means it has iodine inside of it, and that can be a source for a lot of people. Not nowadays so much, especially not you guys listening to this right now. Most of you listening to this are gonna be using Himalayan pink salts and things like that, Celtic sea salt and so on, uh, for the added minerals, and they usually have the iodine, they don't have iodine inside of them. So that's usually not a problem, but if you're not using that type of salt, then check to see if you are consuming iodized salt. Lastly, one of the reasons I don't recommend Generally, the testing for, uh, you know, just the routine testing of iodine is because we know in the very beginning when I talked about it, the body requires iodine. And if you, there's an RDA, which means the minimal amount of iodine that you should be consuming on a daily basis. And that's somewhere between about 150 to 270 micrograms, depending on whether you're a man or a woman and depending on, depending on whether or not you're pregnant um, or lactating. So what, if we know that iodine is required and we know that most people, um, are not getting enough, then I feel comfortable making the recommendation that most people should consume somewhere between the 100 to 200 microgram iodine, uh, microgram 
100 to 200 microgram dose of iodine each and every day. And I don't see problems at that dosing range. And I've tested tens of thousands of people who have used my supplements that have iodine in it. I just don't see a problem with iodine supplementation. So what I'd recommend if you are concerned about it, I think it's safe to just supplement without testing unless, and the, the big unless here is if you have a problem or if you've taken the supplement and you react negatively to it, or if you believe that you're getting high, high, high um, iodine intake from one of the sources I mentioned previously. In those cases, it would be a good idea to potentially think about testing. But before you did that, I would probably recommend that you reduce your iodine intake temporarily from your supplements, beauty products, and so on to see if that improves your problem. If it then doesn't improve your problem, then you would definitely want to consider the testing options that I've mentioned above. So when it comes to using iodine, iodine supplementation, and then testing of iodine, I think that, that the testing of iodine is usually done as a last resort because it's not gonna give you a ton of data and there are other things that you can do which are far more beneficial to your health and to your thyroid status that you can do right away. So that's, that's kind of where I sit and where I land on iodine testing and the iodine supplementation and that's sort of the logic behind it. If you have any questions, I know it's a controversial topic, feel free to leave them below. Uh, do be civil in your responses though because I know this topic tends to make some people angry for some reason. Um, so leave those comments below and I'll do my best to answer those. If you haven't already, make sure that you download my free thyroid PDF resources. I have tons of information all designed to help thyroid patients like you feel better. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today. So otherwise I'll see you in the next one.